Hi, in this video, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a brief summary of uh, an article called What is Strategy by Michael Porter. This is actually a really famous article in the Harvard Business Review and it's 20 pages long. I just want to summarize it so that you get the gist of it without spending hours and hours reading it because it is a dense text. Um, so first, um, first, Michael Porter talks about what strategy is. Strategy is deciding um, a unique position your company wants to be in in the market. And your, you, the unique position you choose to be in um, will determine how you deliver value to your customer. To decide on the unique position, you need to know the existing resources you have at your disposal. Um, for example, it might be the experience of the executive team or the, ex the unique technical expertise of the staff. After you decide on um, the resources you can utilize to deliver value, um, you need to decide what kind of customer segment you are serving. And this is because the different customer segment are different because they have a different way they want their service to be delivered. Um, some customer may care more about price and less about um, how many ways to customize a product or how good it is. They just want a good enough product that's really cheap. Some customer may really, really care about the personal relationship you have with them. Um, whether you know their name, whether they have a pleasant experience with you every, every time, whether you give, them, you give them special discount and special gifts during their birthday, and know a lot about their habits and preferences. And they care a lot about that rather than price. And if you're serving this kind of customer, um, you are choosing to deliver value differently compared to um, a customer who cares a lot, who cares a lot on price, about price. After you decide on the unique position, um, you need to uh, create a list of activities your company would do to make this position or make this goal happen. Because once you have like a big idea of what your company does and how to deliver value, you need to um, narrow, you need to start from, you need to start from the ground and actually turn it into tangible activities that produce incremental results to make this big goal happen. And after you decide on the list of activities um, and you work on those activities, uh, as time passes, as time passes, it's important it's important to make those activities more efficient. Um, to make this activity more efficient because naturally when you do it when you do it for a longer time, you can make it more efficient. It's also important for financial reasons because um, as a business, you would want to cut cost. Cut, cutting costs means you get to keep a greater portion of the sale or the money the customers spend in your store. It could also mean you can decrease the price you charge customer. And this is official. This is especially effective for customers who are price sensitive. And by lowering the price, you can potentially get more sale without reducing your margin. When you have more sale, but the, but the same margin, you get to keep, uh, you get a lot more profit. However, in this article, Michael Porter warns a lot about the operational effectiveness trap. The operational effective trap is when you focus too much on the efficiency of your activities and you start to imitate your competitors' best practices, regardless of whether it suits um, your position, like how you choose to serve a customer or not. Now you may ask, why is it bad to imitate your competitors' best practice? Um, because the more you imitate your competitor's best practice, 
it might also lead to your competitor imitating your best practice as you get better as you get better and better at it. So this essentially means you and your competitors are becoming a lot more similar and doing the same thing. For example, like all of you are competing on price because you all found you're all, all copying each other on what are the ways to deliver the product cheaply. This leads to competitive convergence, which is as you compete, you become more and more similar. Um, it is bad for the company because um, as you get more and more similar um, and more and more efficient, there's a lot less difference between um, the two companies. And it raises the bar for efficiency and raises the bar for uh, customer service, but it doesn't raise your profitability. Now, um, instead of producing 10, uh, mil 10 bubble tea, you had to produce 50 bubble tea, but you're not getting the same benefit because everyone else in the industry is doing the same thing. Everyone else is raising the bar so high that even when you increase uh, the effectiveness, you cannot charge more for it because your competitors suddenly swoop in and learn about your new technique and start implementing it themselves. And now you have to keep up with what they're doing to make sure you don't lag behind. Um, but because everyone is being like evaluated on the same criteria, um, you're basically competing to be the best in that area, but not driving the benefit. Now, what do you do instead? Um, instead, the first thing you do is to sustain your existing advantages, which means building high walls to prevent people from um, imitating you because you don't want to um, be where you be in the position that others are actively copying you and your advantage and unique value are easily copied and you're like constantly in this rat race but you're not like getting actual profit from it. So to prevent imitation, um, you use trade-off. Trade-off means like you choose your activities in such a way that um, the activity has clear uh, trade-offs. For example, if you choose to focus specifically on customers interested in Chinese culture and food and not serving any other type of customer, um, then it would actually prevent your competitors from competing, uh, from copying your activities. Because um, let's say most of your competitors are more interested in serving, um, are interested in, ser in, in serving Haitian food, or some of, your some of your competitors are more interested in serving a wide variety of customers, not just customers interested in Chinese culture. And because of that, they they actually don't want to copy what you're doing um, because it would mean losing, because, because it would mean losing their customers. If they um, only ser serve Chinese food, um, you can actually, they can actually lose customers who are vegetarian, who's not interested in Chinese food. And that's how you maintain your advantage by, um, by focusing really hard on activities that require hard choices. Because um, it can be, because the, the, the sheer fact that your competitor has to make hard choices might be enough of a deterrent to prevent them from copying you. The second thing to do is to connect the activities you do together to create fit. Um, for example, let's say I'm starting a restaurant and the restaurant is to provide great Chinese food and a great introduction to Chinese culture. Um, one level of fit I could do is to get all my activities aligned to this goal. I can hire a great chef, um, which means I can produce a great Chinese food. Um, I can hire all the staff. Uh, I, can make, I can make sure that all the staff I hire speaks Mandarin. 
um, which provides an introduction to Chinese culture. And I can spend a lot on uh, restaurant furnishing so that um, there would be a vibe, there would be a Chinese culture vibe. This is the first level of fit because all these activities work towards the same goal. However, what, however, there is a higher level of fit. It's called each activity amplifies the benefit of the other. Um, this, this is when like one activity, when you do one activity and you do another activity, the fact that you're doing the first activity makes the sec makes uh, makes the benefit of doing the second activity higher. So one plus one is actually larger than two rather than equal to two because they each um, increase the value of the other. An example of that could be um, uh, uh, serving, uh, example could be um, making sure the staff speaks Chinese and um, has education background of has education background of teaching Chinese to um, teaching Chinese to others and um, also making your restaurant um, show make also hanging placards of Chinese and English in your restaurant um, these two making sure your staff speaks Chinese and has like education background and hanging placard of Chinese words could amplify each other's value. Um, for example, like like as the staff is serving the customer food, they can hand they can like hand the customer a small placard and the customer can learn Mandarin and converse with the staff. The reason why it's the second level of fit is because um, like hanging like placard of Chinese word by itself uh, could just mean like it gives it, it gives the customer a chance to flip through Chinese word. However, um, having the plaque, however, having staff who speaks Chinese and has like lang has experience teaching language to others uh, adds value to the placard because the waitress can use placard as like tr as training as like teaching material for the customer. Um, so the staff increase the value of placard. In addition, the placard also increases the, act, the value of having staff who speaks Mandarin because um, the staff can more easily explain complex concepts by having these placards. That's when the activities amplify the benefit of the other. The third level of fit is when um, you choose you choose activities and you make them so um, interconnected that you can get more done with less. And this requires um, quite a lot of experience, reflection, and efficiency improvement. Um, the third thing to do is to um, give your strategy allow your st strategy to give your strategy like at least 10 years for it to have continuity. Continuity is when like you decide on a strategy and um, you have your people and your entire company implement the strategy and get them to improve on it so that each of your activity system becomes more efficient and um, each of your activity system is connected to each other. For example, uh, for example, getting the waitress, uh, waitress, waitress's ability to speak Mandarin and um, educate teaching background with like a placard. The fourth uh, thing to do is make sure not to blindly follow the hot best practice in the industry. Uh, it means to critically evaluate whether this new technique helps you or not. For example, you may um, read an article about how um, robot waitresses and um, fa factory style um, factory style um, serving factory style. Oh, sorry, 
you might read an article of how robot waitresses really reduce the co operational cost. Um, and you might want to implement it because it might reduce the cost of running your business. However, um, when you choose to make this investment and buy a lot of robot waitresses, it's actually very incongruent with your with the general atmosphere of this Chinese restaurant to learn about Chinese culture. And this can actually confuse uh, customers on whether, hey, is this a restaurant where like I learn about Chinese culture or is this a restaurant that's super techie and front edge and I get to interact with the latest tech. And this inconsistency and confusion um, can, um, decreases the distinctiveness you, your restaurant has in the customer's mind, and because it's because it's kind of, kind of confusing, um, it actually decreases your effectiveness because um, they don't really understand your company, and they may not really know. Of what your company stands for, because there are like a lot of mixed signals. The next thing I want to talk to you about is um, something that Porter didn't explicitly mention in this article, but it's a concept that he mentioned in his other books. Uh, it is that return on investment is a better measure of strategy's performance than market share and revenue. Um, because a, company's a, a company is there to make profit, make money. Um, market share just means how much percent of the, how much percent of the customers, how much percent of the customer's wallet you control. Um, however, just because you control a huge amount of customer's wallet, um, it doesn't mean you are profitable because um, the several example Porter listed are um, when companies merge and acquire other companies. However, it's very costly for them and their profitability margin reduced by a lot. Um, for example, for a hundred dollars they bring in, um, they only get to keep one dollar. Whereas before the acquisition, they get to keep twelve dollars. Um, this, a similar concept is revenue. Revenue doesn't equal profit because revenue doesn't tell you the cost of sale. It, does, it just tells you how much money you bring in. It doesn't tell you how much money you get to keep. And a company is essentially operating on the amount of money they get to keep. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is the role of a leader, as Porter, as Porter mentions it in this strategy article. The first responsibility of a leader is to decide on the position. Uh, where are we going to play? Which direction are we going? What's the value we're going to bring in? And decide on, decide on that. The second role of a leader is to communicate the decision to his or her employees, um, because his or her, the, the actual employees um, will face tons of decisions in, your, in their day-to-day -day operation that will affect the company's profitability, profitability and decisions, profitability. Um, but, they need, but the leader needs to know that each of their decision and action and interaction is working towards the company goal. Um, it's working towards the position the company wants to be in. This makes sure that there's no repeated work. And it's the first level of fit because this is where you ensure one plus one equals two. When um, your people work on activities and these activities actually um, improve the bottom line. And communication is how a leader makes it really clear um, in their people's mind, almost helping them develop like a perspective, 
really simple perspective where they can make decisions and adding towards the bottom line. The third role of a leader is discipline, discipline in him or herself, and, and good at enforcing discipline. Um, this, is, uh, this doesn't mean disciplining uh, people, although it might mean uh, although it might be that, but in the, the in this case, discipline is being disciplined in the direction you choose and not get distracted in like what is the latest hot thing and not constantly waver in the strategy you decide. Because if you constantly change the strategy, then your people will get really confused. They wouldn't really know what you do because it's it has been changed so because it changes so often right when they right when they finally understand the first strategy and can implement it you change to another strategy but and you're forcing you're asking them to do something else but they hadn't like understand it enough before you change the search strategy and so it just creates chaos and confusion and reduces effectiveness of the operations However, having discipline doesn't mean uh, being super stuck in one way. Chances are when new technology um, emerges or when the industry changes, that's when a new strategic position um, appears. And being on the lookout and see the, sees the opportunity when the position occurs is really valuable. Because oftentimes, if you like, you, if you are the first to find out about, if you you are the first to act on this new strategic position provided by the changing industry, and you become really really good um, at sustain at sustaining your advantage and providing value to your customer, um, then you can actually monopolize the value you you can actually monopolize or gain a huge chunk of the value in this kind of position and the example mentioned pretty frequently um, in this article is if you are an office worker or like a student with a young family and doesn't have a lot of income where would you shop for your furniture? In many people's mind, it would be IKEA because IKEA has uh, chose a specific strategic position so well that um, for this kind of customer segment, the, IKEA is the prime choice for this kind of customer segment. And IKEA is able to monopolize uh, or actually dominate this this dominates the value and spending power of this type of customer that is actually unprofitable for other companies to imitate IKEA here. One, because of the fit that IKEA already has, it's very difficult to uh, imitate a list of activities. The second is when, because IKEA is already so good at capturing the customer value, it's actually quite unprofitable to do it because it would just be competing um, with someone who's already really good at it. And it will actually be more profitable to find a new next strategic position rather than competing headlong with someone who's already good at this, this thing uh, position. 